was. And I want you to see here in John chapter 21, and I love this story. I've preached it multiple times before, so if you've heard me say some of these things uh, before, please forgive me. I just can't help it. I love this passage. And we won't get to our question until the very end of the message. I'm just going to warn you ahead of time. If you're an A-type personality and you need that question up front, you'll have to read ahead because you're not going to get it till the end. But at this point in, our, in the book of John, and by the way, John is my favorite gospel. He's the only non-synoptic gospel. He's a very unique. He includes stories that no one else includes. He includes perspectives that none of the other three gospel writers included. Um, but we come here, and Jesus has been crucified. Uh, he has been buried. He's risen from the grave. He has appeared uh, before his disciples numerous times. And we come here to the last chapter of the book of, of John, and, and we find Peter. Peter is one of my favorite characters in the Bible. I, th I, I talk to so many people that say, I really relate with Peter. I think we all do in some ways. Uh, but Peter, here's Peter, and, and he, if you remember, in, in Luke 22, he promises Jesus, and Jesus says, you all are going to betray me tonight, or you're going to, I'm not saying betray, you're all going to forsake me tonight. And Peter says, Lord, I don't care what the rest of these guys here are going to do, but I'm going to stay with you to the death or to prison. I don't care what it is, I'm going to be with you. Jesus tells him before sun rises, you're going to have denied me three times. And of course, we know that's what happened. The crow calls out and, uh, before sunrise, and uh, Peter has already denied Christ three times. He's cursed his name the last time, which is hard to fathom. And then the, the, the bird calls out, and Jesus looks at Peter, and Peter weeps. All of that took place, and, and uh, Peter's got to feel as though he is an absolute uh, and utter failure. Have you ever been there before, by the way? You don't need to raise your hand, but... I've been there. I'll raise my hand. I, I have so many times. You know, I was just sharing with a deaf guy that I disciple. I, I shared with him that I've been saved. This, this summer, I'm going to have been saved. Be, I will have been saved for 57 years of my life. Actually, I think it's 58. My math is not good. I think it's 58. And there have been a lot of times I've made God promises that I have not followed through with. And there have been many times that I've asked God for forgiveness for something, and then I'm crawling back in there just a couple of hours later asking forgiveness for the same thing. I don't know if that's ever happened to you. You're probably far more spiritual than me. But I struggle with feeling as though I'm a failure, and God should be able to find somebody way better than me to be able to do the work that he's put in front of me to do. And I continually tell God, well, God, if nobody else shows, I'll go. I think that's the way Peter felt, but Peter felt a little more than that. If you look here in, in chapter 21 with me, look at the very beginning of the chapter. Look at verse 3. Uh, well, let's go back up to verse 2. Then were together Simon Peter and Thomas called Didymus and Nathaniel of Canaan, Cana in Galilee and the sons of Zebedee, we know that's James and John, and two other of his disciples. Look at verse 3. Simon Peter saith unto them, say the words out loud with me, would you, till the period, I go a fishing. Peter said, I go a fishing. Now, I don't know that he was saying to the other guys, hey, you guys want to go fishing? I think he just was saying to them, you know what? Jesus has risen from the dead. I'm, I'm great with that. I'm so glad Jesus rose from the dead because I know I failed him. I'm going to go back to doing what I did before Jesus called me to be a disciple. And he said, I'm going to go fishing. Now, perhaps Peter was still feeling the sting of his failure in that most recent uh, a crucial time of his three denials of Christ. I, and I think that's probably part of the reason. Uh, it's my opinion that Peter thought that because of those three failures, that Jesus would not want to use him anymore in the future. Have you ever been there? I've been there before, too. Maybe you haven't. If you haven't, uh, I'm just going to warn you, you probably will at some point feel that way. By the way, if you're honest with yourself, you, you'll feel that way every day. None of us is worthy to serve the king of all kings. But Peter felt, I think, a special, uh, 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 really just a d discouragement from his own personal failures. His decision to go back to fishing turned from fishing for men, which is what Jesus told him he would do, to trying to catch fish again. 
And of course, he says to these, these men, uh, I'm going to go. By the way, there's six of them. Six of the remaining ten disciples are here in, this, in that list of, on, in verse 2, including Peter. Uh, Judas, of course, Judas Iscariot has hung himself. And uh, so there, there are these, these six men go back. They, they get on the ship with Peter, and they're going to go out to, to, to catch fish. Now, you know what strikes me here? And I want you to catch this. This is really important. Whether Peter knew it or not, he was still leading. I want you to catch this. Peter felt like a failure. Peter's going back to what he did before. And I really believe in my heart, and I don't know it because I wasn't there, but I really believe that he felt, I've denied the Lord, certainly he cannot use me. Whether Peter knew it or not, or liked it or not, he was a leader of men. He just said, I'm going to go fishing. You read it with me. I go a fishing. That's all he said. And before he knew it, the boat's moving, and there's other guys getting in with him. Whether Peter knew it or not, he was, he was a leader. And let me say this to you, please. And I want this to be personal, personal, personally applicable to all of us all through tonight. Something that I've learned is this. When God calls you to serve him, you will fail him. Hello? When God calls you to serve him, you will fail him. But that doesn't mean God takes his hand off of you. And the things God has called you to do, he is going to do it whether you know it or not. Peter said, I'm going to go fishing. These other men came with him. The story then goes, uh, as, and we'll skip some of this. We won't read every verse, but the story goes that, and by the way, it's kind of very closely parallel to when Jesus initially called Peter. They go back out, they fish all night, they catch what? Zippo, nothing. I don't think there's anything worse than fishing and not catching anything. Well, it might be hunting and not getting... Well, I don't know, but it's, it's not fun is what I'm getting at. You, you take a worm out and you give it a swim, you know, is what, if you're not catching fish. But they weren't even using hooks and, and poles. They were, they were going through the laborious, th uh, throwing the nets out and pulling them back in. And time after time after time, no fish, no fish, no fish. Finally, the sun's getting ready to come up and they, they make their way back in toward the shore. And they're on the shore. They don't realize it right away, but you know the story. It's Jesus there. And he says to them, take your nets and throw it on the other side. And of course, as soon as they do it, their, their nets fill with uh, fish. And by the way, if you haven't watched in The Chosen yet, if you haven't watched it yet, the scene where, the, where Jesus tells them to throw their net on the other side and it goes in the early, it's in that first season. It's pretty incredible. Uh, how, the, the picture of it, I hope you get to see it. But uh, their nets fill with fish and as soon as it does, one of them says, that's Jesus on the shore. Only he could do that, that's for sure. They're catching fish at the wrong time of day in the wrong spot because they obeyed the man on the shore. They recognize it's Jesus. Peter, you know good old Peter. He impulsively jumps out of the ship and he swims to the shore. He doesn't wait for the other guys and they, they come in and there Jesus prepared breakfast for them. That brings us down to verses, uh, the verse uh, below here. I got to get on the right page if I'll find it there. Uh, chapter 21, drop down to verse 15 with me. Because in verses 15 and 16, Jesus asks uh, Peter a question. I'm going to run through this pretty quickly because I have covered this before at some point, and probably you've heard it, so I won't spend as much time on it as I would if I thought you had never heard it before. But Jesus asks him, if you look there in verse 15, so when they had dined, Jesus saith to Simon Peter, here's the question, Simon, and by the way, it's repeated in verse 16 exactly this same way, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? Simon, do you love me? Now, when Jesus asked the question to us it, it's in English, it lacks some of the depth of, of meaning that it would if you were going to study this in the Greek because the word that Jesus used for lovest in that, ver in that beginning of verse 15 and in verse 16 when he asked the question, do you love me? Both times it's the word agape. What does agape mean? What's that? You're supposed to answer out loud right now. That's what the, when I'm doing this, that means I can't hear a thing. Well, agape love is what kind of love? God's love. It's sacrificial love. It's, it's the love of Jesus on the cross. 
That was agape love demonstrated, a life given for another. Jesus asked Peter, do you love me enough to give your life for me? And twice Peter answers the same, the same response. He says, if you look down there in the verse, he saith unto him, yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. Now the word that Peter uses here, again in English, is the same word love that we have, but it's the Greek word phileo, which means brotherly love, the city of Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. Uh, it's the word phileo. It means, Lord, I don't love you enough to sacrifice myself for you, but I love you like a brother. Now, let me tell you that there's a reason that I think Peter answered the way he did, and Jesus asked the way he did. Jesus asked Peter, will you love me enough to do what you promised me in Luke 22, that you would go to the death or go to prison for me? Do you love me like that? Peter had already committed that to Jesus in Luke 22 and failed how many times? I'm giving you help. He did it. He failed three times. He denied three times. By the way, Jesus is going to ask three questions here. These are not our questions for tonight. They're just leading us to the question. The first two times Jesus asked, do you love me enough to die for me? Peter answers, Lord, I love you like a brother. The third time Jesus asked the question, verse 17, he saith unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Now, when we read our, our English version of this, it looks the same as the other two. But Jesus changes the Greek word from agape to phileo. So Jesus says to Peter, Peter, do you love me like a brother? Look at the next words, and you'll understand why uh, it says what it says. Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, lovest, phileo, lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I phileo love thee. By the way, all three times Jesus told him to feed his sheep or feed his lambs. God, uh, Jesus was not done with Peter and he let him know it very, very clearly here. But that brings us to the point of our question for tonight. So this intimate time with Peter and Jesus, by the way, I don't think the other disciples probably heard a lot of this. Maybe John did because he recorded it. Maybe he was close enough that he overheard the conversation. Regardless of how it happens, it was a very intimate time with Peter and Jesus at this point. And I want you to see, so this, this has happened. And by the way, verse 18, let's read it because it does describe to us uh, the depth of what this meant. Verse 18, verily, verily, Jesus says, I say unto thee, when thou wast young, thou girdest thyself and walkest whither thou wouldest. You know what Jesus said, Peter? You were headstrong when you were young. And that was true, wasn't it? You did whatever you wanted, whenever you wanted, however you wanted. Lord, don't just wash my feet, wash all of me. I mean, Peter went 100, 100 miles an hour whenever he did anything. He, says, he goes on, but when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and another shall gird thee, and carry thee whither thou wouldest not. This spake he, signifying by what death he should glorify God. Folks, I want you to know, uh, we don't have it in our scriptures, but the history books tell us that Peter was martyred for his faith. He died demonstrating agape love. He was, they were going to crucify Peter, from what I've read. Peter said, no, I, I don't want to be crucified like Christ. I'm not worthy. They crucified him upside down. They literally spread his arms, as Jesus says here, they, they, they stretched forth his hands and others girded him. And guess what? Peter, praise God, Peter did die with agape love. Now, I don't, I'm not saying praise God he died, but I am saying praise God. What he could not promise Jesus in verses 15 and 16, he demonstrated in his life and the way that he, the, that he died. Look what it says there in verse 19. And when he had spoken this, he, that is Jesus, said to him, follow me. Now here's where the question comes and here's where the application comes for us tonight. I want you to see what happens. Look down in verse 20. Then Peter, turning about, seeth his disciple whom Jesus loved following. Who is that? John. Did you know that that phrase, the disciple Jesus loved, is in your scriptures four times? They're all in the book of John. And John uses them all the time to de describe himself. I love that. <laughs> That's like me saying, I say this to my brother-in-laws all the time. I have three brother-in-laws. I tell them all, I'm the favorite son-in-law. I tell them that all the time. 
to the point where I think they believe it. I think my mother-in-law might believe it too, but I'm not positive. I think the jury might still be out. I was the favorite son-in-law, and then I messed up. But anyway, I'm, I'm trying to get back in there. But I love that Peter calls himself the disciple whom Jesus loved. By the way, Jesus did love him, amen? He gave his life for him, and John couldn't get over it. I like that he calls himself that. So Peter sees John following, which also leaned on his breast at supper and said, Lord, which is it that betrayeth thee? So we know exactly who he's talking about. Look at verse 21 now. Peter, here's our question. Peter, seeing him, saith to Jesus, Lord, what shall this man do? When I first started working on this series uh, of questions from the Bible, this is one of the very first questions that came to my mind. You say, why in the world would you think of that? Because I really believe that God, if, if you're saved and you're in this room tonight, how many of you tonight, you know if you died right now, you, you're on your way to heaven, you know it without a doubt, there's nothing in your heart that's doubtful about it. Is there anybody that's not sure? Would you raise your hand? I'll, I'll talk to you in a little bit. Anybody? So all of us here are saying, we know that, that we're on our way to heaven. Hey, can I tell you something? If God saved you, he wants you to serve him. God did not save you to come hold that pew down that you're sitting on right now and complain about what everybody else is not doing in the church. God saved you for you to serve him. There should have been an amen after that, Lou. <laughs> God saved you to what? God saved you to serve him. And he has something for you to do. And if you're not doing anything for God other than showing up at church, by the way, that's great that you show up at church. But that's just your duty, as the Bible says. That's not anything extra. You might feel great that you're here on a Wednesday night. Man, I'm getting extra credit for Wednesday night. No, you're not. That's your duty. Not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together. That's what we're supposed to do. You don't get any extra credit for that. What you get extra credit for is that God has called you and God has enabled you and God has gifted you to serve him in ways no one else can serve. And if you don't do what God gave you to do, then this whole body of Christ here, Valley Forge Baptist, suffers. The reason this question came to me is because I do this far too many times. God touches my heart. Jim, I want you to do this. And he makes it clear to me. And I don't want to do what God asked me to do. I don't know. Again, maybe I'm not as spiritual as you. But sometimes God touches my heart to do something. I say, God, I really don't want to do that. When, when God called me to work with the deaf, I've told this story before, and, and please, again, forgive me if you've heard it before. I was sitting in our church back here. We had a, a, a church auditorium probably twice the size of this one. Some of you have been there, Church of the Open Door in Westminster, Maryland. I was sitting back here on Sunday night. On, on a Sunday night, Ted Camp was the preacher. I didn't know him from the man in the moon. He preached, and God touched my heart, and, and God touched my heart with this thought. Somebody's got to go tell deaf people about Jesus somebody and so you know what I decided I would help the Holy Spirit I was going to find somebody that should go and help the deaf and so I began looking across auditorium you know by the way I was an assistant pastor I was teaching a young married couples class I was running a Christian camp in the summer I was teaching Bible in a Christian school I was coaching soccer or basketball I, I was youth pastor literally I'm not lying to you Carol and, and Craig can tell you it's the truth I was doing all that stuff and I said to God, I've got enough to do. Somebody else needs to do that. And I began to pick out some people that I thought God should use. And every time I'd point there, the finger would come back and point at me. And I would say, God, not me. I'm not the guy. It has to be somebody else. Can I tell you something? I'm so grateful I'm the guy. I couldn't be more thrilled that God called Terry and I to go to this forgotten people. And we've gotten, we've gotten to pour our lives out in deaf people. And we love it. God has blessed us so much. But at the beginning, I was saying, well, what about that guy? This is what I was doing that night in Westminster, Maryland. God, well, what's that guy going to do over there? He's not doing anything. Well, what about that lady over there? She could be doing it. And I mean, I was, I was really trying to help God out. But 
I, I learned very early on, I'm not the Holy Spirit. And, and everybody I picked wouldn't have worked because God was picking me. But I was ready to push it off on someone else. And, and, and so I want you to see, and we're going we're gonna to close with this application. So Peter says here, what shall this man do? Lord, what about this other person? After all, uh, John is probably far more gifted than I am, Peter might have said. Just like I said, Lord, I'll go to Ukraine, but you need to get somebody better than me to go. But if nobody goes, then I'll go. You know, and, and, and can I say this to you? What God has asked me to do is none of your business. <laughs> And what God has called you to do is none of my business. But it is my business to do what God called me to do. And it is God's business for you to do what God has called you to do. And if each of us would do that, let me tell you something. Pastor would never have to stand up and ask for volunteers to help with any ministry in this church because if we all, honestly, if we all did the one thing God called us to do, there would not be a need in this church for anything to be done other than what's being done because God has called, equipped, gifted, and sent. Our problem is too many of us are sitting in our pew saying, what shall that man do? What shall that woman do? God, what are they going to do? I, I don't, I don't want to do that, so what are they going to do? And I want to say to you tonight that um, it's, it's important that we accept responsibility to follow the plan that God has for each of us. Can I say to you, uh, the scariest thing in the world is to serve the Lord because he usually asks us to go out of our comfort zone. We have a pastor who wore out Tic Tacs for the first years of his ministry because he had a fear of public speaking. Are you with me? But look what God's done with a man who said to God, I think there should be somebody else, but I'll go. Honestly, think about it. God has blessed this ministry because we have a pastor who said, I'll do what you called me to do. I'm nervous. I'm, my knees are going to shake underneath my pants while I'm preaching, but I'm going to preach. And God has blessed. I remember the first time I stepped in a prison. I was so nervous. I, I really was okay until that first door sl slammed behind me. And if you've ever been in a prison uh, ministry, sorry, if you've ever been in... <laughs> Some of you have been in prison too, but if you've ever been in a prison ministry, that door sounds like it's about 500 pounds heavy, and that lock sounds like you couldn't get it open with no matter what. It'll shake your bones. And I remember saying to God when I heard that door close the first time, God, I came in here for you. I'm praying you're going to get me out of here. <laughs> And by the way, I still pray that way. Amen. Those of you who go to prison, you know what I'm talking about. I'm sure glad. I love going in there, but I love coming out too. But you know what? God opened the door for me to do prison ministry, and I love it. I love it. I love being able to take the Word of God to people who are so hungry for Scriptures that they read their Bibles all through the day. Uh, the man that took me into prison the very first time was a little short Italian man named Leo D'Arcangelo. He was Pastor D. He was an assistant pastor at Bible Baptist in Westchester. And he asked me one day on a whim, he said, hey, have you ever gone to prison? Do you want to go to prison with us? And I said, sure. Because by the way, when God opens a door, I just figure it's best to step through than to try to fight with God about it. So I just said, sure. And uh, by the way, Pastor D. Archangelo got saved in Holmesburg State Prison. He was 17 years old. And he got saved. And he spent another two years in prison. But when he got out, he went to Bible college from Philadelphia College of the Bible, I believe. Graduated. He was in the ministry all the way until the Lord took him home. I was in prison with Pastor D. The last time he ever stepped foot in prison, he and I were there together. But I realize if there's a guy like Pastor D that got his life turned around, every other one of those people in that prison has that same opportunity. And I don't know who they are, and I don't know where they are, but I want to go and do my part. Anyway, let me get back on track here. We, need, we are responsible to do what God calls us to do. Now, let me say to you, Peter may have felt unqualified. Jesus didn't care. Peter may have felt unqualified. Jesus didn't care. 
because Jesus knew if Peter would stay pliable like clay in his hand, that he could mold him into the man he would need to be for the places he would need to be and do the jobs he would need to do. And can I say to you, our God is still alive today. All he's looking for is clay that is soft, a heart that is soft, a person who is willing to do whatever, wherever, whenever, as long as God goes with them. And by the way, God's ready to go. He's ready to equip. He's ready to go. He's ready to use you. What, what is the problem is, is we're sitting in our pew saying, what will this man do? Let me get you to the last and most important part, and, and we are really close to done. Jesus saith unto him, verse 22, I'm sorry. Peter, go to 21. Peter, seeing him, saith to Jesus, Lord, what shall this man do? Verse 22. Jesus saith unto him, if I will that he tarry till I come, here's a good question, what is that to thee? Now, if I was going to put that in my language, I would say, if, if I were Jesus, I'd say, mind your own business. <laughs> it's none of your business what I'm going to do with John. Look at the last words. Follow thou me. I'm not talking to John. I'm talking to you. And can I say to you tonight, God's looking right at us eyeball to eyeball tonight. And he's saying to us, don't worry about what anybody else is doing for me. You do what I called you to do. Think about all that God did through Peter and John, just those two guys. Peter stands there on the day of Pentecost. By the way, he didn't even know he was preaching. I don't believe he heard people saying they're drunk in the middle of the day and he couldn't take any more. Amen. By the way, that's the way God made Peter. Aren't you glad? Because Peter stood up and he said, we're not drunk. What you don't realize is Jesus was crucified, was buried, rose from the grave, and we saw him. By the way, while he's preaching that, God's given the gift of tongues and people in, six, I counted, I think, 16 different uh, countries that are talked about there in Acts. And they're all hearing the gospel in their own language because Peter was bold enough to stand up. By the way, Thomas didn't stand up. Wasn't his job. James didn't stand up. He's going to be the pastor of the church in Jerusalem, but it wasn't his job. It was Peter's job on that day. And what if Peter had not spent this time with Jesus and Jesus said to him, follow thou me. You do what I've called you to do and don't worry about anybody else. Peter stood up and he preached that message in Acts chapter 2. By the way, he preached it again in Acts chapter 4, almost the same exact message, which makes me feel good because I preach the same thing more than once sometimes. <laughs> hey, it worked once. I figured, he figured I'm going to throw it out and it worked again the second time. And what was he preaching? The gospel. We saw Jesus alive. We saw him crucified. We saw him buried. And we saw him rise from the grave. We saw this Savior. He is the Messiah. And by the way, he would give his life for that Messiah. And John would be faithful all the way to the end. He wrote the last book of our Bible. What, what, what am I saying tonight? I don't know what God's called you to do. I just know what he's called me to do. And I'm going to try to do all that I can with what I have until God calls me home. Amen? Amen. And I want you to do the same thing because I believe that if we will all do what we can and should do, we will not need to pray for revival in our nation. It will begin because God's people being led by God and empowered by God will have the touch of God and God will do his work in us if we'll just let him. Ted Camp says, he said it so many times, I'll share it with you, and he says, God could do far more if we'd give him more to work with. God wants to use you tonight. I know it without a doubt. I don't know how he wants to use you. I'm not a prophet, but I do know he wants to use us, each and every one of us. And he's just waiting for us to follow him. That's it. Just follow him. When God calls you to serve him, step out by faith and obey him. Father, thank you for these questions that we've had over these last seven weeks. I'm thankful for this question tonight, and I'm thankful that Peter went and did what you said. I'm thankful that he did not wallow in self-pity. He did not wallow in past failures. 
He did not stay where he had been on that day. He denied you three times. He moved to the place where he accepted your call and obeyed. God, Peter's in heaven. We are here. And I know that you want to serve, you want to use us today just like you used those men back in those days and those women. God, help us not to point to others and wonder what they're supposed to do. Help us to look to you and do everything we're supposed to do. We ask that you would use us, use this church, Lord, to be a lighthouse in this place. We believe the days are shortened until you're coming. Please help us not to be sitting, souring, and soaking. Help us to be serving. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.